We've got five announcements. First of all, we have men's prayer breakfast is a week from this Saturday. So, men, you can be thinking about uh, coming, and we'll be starting something new. I'm not sure what it is yet. I'm working through several options, but we'll see if I can snag anybody to come and speak um, related to the coming election. And we have to recognize that the election may be the first week of November, but early voting starts about the second week of October. So that means we've got to start thinking about this and praying about it. This is very important, I, I think a very important election. And what I've kind of what I'd like to do on with the men's prayer breakfast is get a, two or three um, men at the state level to come in and talk to us about the importance of what they're doing and what needs to be done and really understand state issues um, better. But I'm not having everybody so busy dur traveling during the summer. I'm not having a lot of success right now. Camp Arete is July 17th to the 24th. Pray for Camp Arete. We're just talking with uh, Jeff about that. Uh, just pray for logistics, travel, a lot of people traveling, safety traveling, things like that. VBS is that same week. That's Vacation Bible School, July 19th to 21st. I think we still need a couple of volunteers to help out. Uh, the memorial service for Jay Collins will be here at the church at Saturday, uh, July 30th at 11 a.m. And then uh, Jeff will be going to Brazil. Pray for him and that trip. He's teaching at a pastor's assembly August 25th to September 5th. A lot of things going on. Uh, we got a full schedule coming up for the fall as well. So be in prayer for all of those things. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we'll make sure that we are ready to study God's word. We need to make sure we're in right relationship with the Holy Spirit, walking by the Spirit, all terms related to a close intimacy where we are living our life in pursuit of the same goals that God has for us, uh, moving towards those same goals in partnership with God, walking by the Spirit. But when we sin, we breach that fellowship. It's restored by confession of sin. So we have silent prayer so people can make sure they're ready to study the Word. So let's bow our heads together, and after a few moments of silent prayer, then I'll open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, it's a great privilege we have to meet together in freedom, thinking about the fact that, that such a legacy was laid down for us by the Founding Fathers, uh, such wisdom that came only from your word and the way in which you worked to bring all of those men together, both at the uh, Convention for the Declaration of Independence, at the uh, when they met and writing the Declaration of Independence and then later at the Constitutional Convention, we pray that we might have men and women dedicated to the Constitution that will rise up, make the sac leadership sacrifices to stand for the truth, stand for your word. And we realize that that which has occurred in this country is the result of a long process going back at least 200 years and Father, we know that it will not change overnight. And we pray that we might not put our hope and trust in man, but that we would put our hope and trust in you, that only you can change things. And Father, we pray that you will. But if not, Father, we pray that we might be steadfast in our testimony and our walk with you, never doubting, uh, never getting discouraged, always confident that you are in control. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. We are in a study, which I began last week, as we're looking at, uh, at Gideon, where we're told that he was filled 
with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit came upon him. Literally, it is saying in the Hebrew that he was clothed, or the Holy Spirit clothed himself. A very vivid imagery. The Holy Spirit clothed himself with Gideon. The previous two judges had no relation to the Holy Spirit. The Othniel was the first, as we'll see in just a second in our review. But this is unusual. So it, we're, it's important for us to understand what is going on in the Old Testament with God the Holy Spirit. A lot of people are confused, and a lot of theologians are confused about this. There's a number of books that I read when I was, when I was younger. Uh, Dwight Pentecost's book, The Divine Comforter, was an outstanding book. Charles Ryrie wrote a book on the Holy Spirit. John Walford wrote a couple of different books on the Holy Spirit, all of which are very fine, and a couple of others, none of which I would agree with 100%. There's a lot of confusion on certain things, certain things in relation to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, certain things in relation to the role of the Holy Spirit in the church age, this whole concept of the filling by the Spirit uh, as distinctive, even though most of those men would agree 100% with our view of the filling of the Spirit and confession of sin, they had a problem in that they confused the phraseology and the verbiage in Ephesians 5.18 with similar verbiage, but different words, critical to understand that, but different words in the Greek in Ephesians, I mean, excuse me, in Acts. Acts is not talking about what Ephesians 5.18 is when it talks about the fact that the apostles were full of the Spirit, and full of truth. That's not different words and different grammar. So these are important things to distinguish and have not been faithfully distinguished in our tradition. So uh, that has to be, all of these things have to be dealt with. In fact, I'm, I'm thinking about writing a book. I hate saying that because that means it'll never get done. I have a hard time. There are always too many interruptions. Writing is very time consuming. And when you're doing full preparations, uh, three or four, five, sometimes five times a week. It's just difficult. Life inter interferes. But I've got, on most of these I've taught many times, and so I have good notes that I've developed by teaching through this several times. All I need to do is sit and find un three or four uninterrupted hours every day to write. With God, all things are possible. <laughs> okay, so... That's the hope. Now, I ran across a quote. Somebody emailed me this morning, and it is a great quote, considering this is the week where we just celebrated our nation's birthday yesterday and uh, with the Declaration of Independence, and this is a statement that was made by John Adams. And in this statement, you can see the influence of the Scripture on his thinking, and it's a warning. He said, democracy will soon degenerate into an anarchy. Such an anarchy that every man will do what is right in his own eyes. How prescient. Right out of Scripture. Every man will do what is right in his own eyes, and no man's life or property or reputation or liberty will be secure. Think about that. No, life, property, reputation, liberty. None will be secure in an anarchy where all are doing what's right in their own eyes, which is right where we are. He goes on to say, and every one of these will soon mold itself into a system of subordination of all the moral virtues and intellectual abilities, all the powers of wealth, beauty, wit, and science to the wanton pleasures, the capricious will, and the execrable cruelty of one or a very few. In other words, tyranny. Insightful. 200 years ago, the Word of God, and these men studied so much, and I talked about this on Sunday morning, about the study that was done um, by Donald Lutz at the University of Houston, where he, they, they showed that that when examining the citations, the quotations that were put, uh, specifically cited, not just alluded to, in speeches, writings, diaries, letters, whatever, of the, of the founding fathers, that they, they relied on the scripture. And the quotes that they took, mostly from people like John Locke and Montesquieu and a number of others, were 
statements they made on the basis of Scripture. And, and the point is that, that a Judeo-Christian worldview was so dominant at that time that it didn't matter whether you were a believer or an unbeliever. You were influenced. You still thought within that system of absolute morality. The, you still thought God was the creator. You still believed in those biblical, foundational biblical ideas that we no longer believe in. And without believing in those foundations, we see the same thing happened to us that happened in Israel. It happened in Israel several times. It happens now before there's a king. It happens again under Solomon and gets worse in the southern kingdom than after the, and with the split that occurred after, after uh, Solomon, the northern kingdom and southern kingdom. It, that's just the cycle of the northern kingdom related to idolatry. Southern kingdom go, recovers and then goes through the cycle again two or three times. And this is a, we could call it a cycle of civilization. But it is true of those nations that have been heavily influenced by the Bible. And so it is a slide from a nation that is oriented to God and oriented to truth and oriented to absolutes, oriented to grace, oriented to the cross, and how they deteriorate, how they fall apart, how they collapse under the influence of pagan ideas. And people say, well, sometimes you're, that's awfully harsh. I read this morning that this killer, this murder, mass murderer that, that shot on the, fired indiscriminately into the crowds at the 4th of July parade up in uh, Highland Park, I think that's the name of it, in, in Chicago. His mother is some kind of new age counselor. You know, he grew up in a home where the family life was falling apart. A coach of his, when he was young, said that uh, he and his brother were always the last ones to get picked up by the parents. They'd have to call the parents to come pick up their kids after practice. They had a horrible home life. And it was a home life that was deeply entrenched in pagan ideas. And ideas have consequences, and bad ideas have terrible destructive con con And we're, we're not addressing these things. It also didn't have, qu wasn't quite crazy enough to be admitted into a mental institution. And we're not addressing these problems. We think it's a gun. It's not a gun. Uh, people had guns everywhere. Some of us remember when we were in high school that there were lots of kids that would drive their pickup trucks to high school with a a 30 odd six or a shotgun on the on the gun rack. They would not even lock their cars while they were in school all day. They would get out at three o'clock. They would get in the car, drive out to where all those houses now are, out towards Katy, and all of that was just open prairie. And they'd go duck hunting or goose hunting in the fall, or uh, all of a sudden, and nobody ever was concerned about it. What changed wasn't the presence of guns. They've always been there. What changed was the soul. What changed was the parenting. What changed was the family environment. What changed was the level of discipline that was expected in the schools. That's what changed. What changed was a shift spiritually away from God. And that's exactly what we see in the time of the judges. So with Gideon, as with others, there is this statement that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. One thing I wanted to point out here in this slide, I've underlined Othniel, Gideon, Jephthah, and Samson. Those are the only four judge, judges where there's a statement in relation to the Holy Spirit coming upon them, rushing upon them, clothing himself with them, something of that nature. So this was even unique at that time period. This is not normative. Not every judge had a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Not every king had a relationship with the Holy Spirit. We know of Saul, we know of David, but it's not specifically stated of other kings in the Old Testament. It's true of the prophets, especially the writing prophets, but for any prophet to speak the word of the Lord had to be by the Holy Spirit. And as I have worked through this, you had a few priests, you had a few others we're going to look at, and it's a small number, probably less than a hundred 
in all of those years of the Old Testament had any relationship with the Holy Spirit. And that's just not understand. We have too many Christians, church-age believers, who are reading the experiences of the Holy Spirit in the church age back into the previous dispensations, and that just leads to a lot of confusion. So what do we make of this statement, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon? Well, last night, time we started talking about, you know, did the introduction to what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. The last verse I have in my list of verses is Zechariah 4, 6, which I think should really be the summation of the significance of the Holy Spirit, even in the Old Testament. Not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. The Spirit was indeed active, even though his ministry was not in the same way that it is in the church age, because Israel, in the second half of the Old Testament period, as it were, and just the Gentiles in the period before Abraham, did not have that kind of personal relationship with God, God the Holy Spirit. So we started by just asking the question, how would a first century Jew understand the use of the term Holy Spirit when, Matt, when John the Baptist came along and said, the one that comes after me will baptize you by the Spirit and by fire? They didn't say, wait a minute, what do you mean by the Spirit? What does that mean? They didn't say, what do you mean by fire? They already knew that. People say there's no trinity in the Old Testament. Well, you have the mention of the Holy Spirit many, many times in the, in the uh, Old Testament. And you have conversations between one who is divine, who is identified as the servant of Yahweh in, uh, in Isaiah, who has conversations with God. You have the angel of the Lord who seems to be identified with Yahweh in many passages and having conversation with Yahweh in other passages. So there's clearly a plurality of divine persons in the Old, Old Testament. Of course, uh, Jews have worked for 2,000 years to try to uh, negate that evidence and to say, no, 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 they were just strict monotheists. But the strict monotheism of modern Judaism didn't come in until after the destruction uh, of Jerusalem. So I looked at passages in Matthew where uh, there's an announcement by Gabriel that Mary was with child by the Holy Spirit. And, and Mary didn't say, well, well what's that? So the it's assumed they know, and they talked about it, and they understood exactly what was meant uh, when the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove at his baptism, or dr drove him into the wilderness. Um, when John the Baptist came along, and Luke says that he was filled from the, by the Holy, or filled as I would translate, filled from the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, they un they they didn't ask these these kinds of questions. Uh, John not only records some of the events around Jesus' baptism, where the Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove, but also Jesus' words to Nicodemus in John 3, that unless you are born of water and the Spirit, and whatever is born of the Spirit is Spirit. These clearly show that there is an understanding of this Spirit of God, this Spirit terminology in the Gospels. Other passages talk about the Holy Spirit as a separate person, his involvement in sanctification and in our fellowship, our partnership with God are, are highlighted. He has these characteristics of a person. He's called another helper like me. That's what Jesus is using. It's the word there, alas. He is another of the same kind. He has will. He has... Um, we are to walk by means of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.16. Uh, he sanctifies us, 1 Peter 1.2. Uh, the Holy Spirit is ascribed the works of deity, uh, Romans 8.11. Omnipotence, Romans 15.19. If you weren't didn't listen the last time, you think I'm going real fast, but this is just review. Uh, omniscience, Isaiah 40.13 and 14, uh, as quoted in Romans 11. Uh, 30, 34, indicating he has omniscience and omnipresence. So what we see in the Old Testament is this triune 
expression of the of the Godhead. The Father is portrayed as the divine architect. He's the planner. He's the one in charge. There's an authority structure in the Trinity. Second, the Son is portrayed as the project manager. He's going to oversee uh, the uh, creation, and he's the revealer of the Father. And then the Holy Spirit's the project engineer who oversees exactly what gets done. He's the one hovering over the earth and mentioned in the second verse of the Old Testament. It's not like the Holy Spirit is introduced late in the Old Testament. The second verse of the Old Testament, almost uh, every book of the Old Testament mentions the Spirit. He's mentioned in the first book, mentioned in the last book. And he is the one who oversees divine revelation. And he brings together creation, regeneration, divine revelation. And then in the New Testament, he empowers the life of the church age believer. The key word in the Old Testament is this word, ruach, that's used over 387 times. But sometimes it refers to the uh, just everyday breeze, breath, wind, air. Other times it refers to something that is vain or futile. Other times it refers to the breath of God that supports life. Uh, at other times it refers to the human spirit. That is, it's just a term for either for an attitude or for a frame of mind, or it can be just a summary term for the immaterial part of man. And other times it has a more distinct meaning. You have to determine it each context, each time, and then the Holy Spirit. So it's difficult to find out how many times the Holy Spirit's mentioned in the Old Testament because you can't just do a word study on spirit because you get a lot of other meanings. Even when you, I looked up my spirit, there's a lot of times when a human is talking about my spirit. So it it's, uh, came up with about at least 85 distinct references to the Holy Spirit. There's probably, I would guess, maybe twice that, but it would take a lot of time to read every single uh, reference. So uh, this is what the Holy Spirit describes. So we got down here to this uh, second point, tracing the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And my point here is simply that this isn't a late development. There, there's no evolution of, th of theology, evolution of the Yahwistic religion of the Old Testament, as some liberal scholars will put it. You know, they always come up with some fancy ways to talk about uh, things that they don't believe really happened the way the Bible says they happened. And so um, we look at these two books, Genesis, the first book of the Pentateuch, and then Job. I believe Job was, may have been written first. I, I, would, I would guess it was the first book written. I think Job was written by Moses, just as the Pentateuch, but you can't prove that. There's no evidence of that. That's just my a sense. I'm not the only one who has that opinion, but uh, you can't be dogmatic about that. There's no certainty there. But Job answers the fundamental question people ask, and that is, if there is a loving God, why does he let bad things happen? And God addressed that, I believe, in the very first book that, that he wrote, and that's Job. And that's just a theological argument, but I think that, uh, that it has some bearing. We don't know. But it's clear that in the second verse of the first book of the Old Testament, the, uh, arguably the oldest or second oldest book ever written, you have a reference to the Spirit of God. And then when you come to Malachi, there's a reference to the Spirit of God. And there are references to the Spirit of God that are sprinkled in many books all in between. So this is not some secondary idea. It's not something that Christians are reading back into the Old Testament. It's something that is, that is clearly there. What we learn in Genesis 1-2 is when God created the earth at some time after that, something happens. We don't know what we, what fits is the angelic revolt, and that it's not just simply a statement that the earth was without form and void, but there is a disjunctive conjunction at the beginning which shows a break with what was stated 
in the verse before. And that here it says that the earth was three things, without form and void. It was a, a darkness on the face of the deep. Three terms. The deep is a negative term in Scripture. The darkness is when you come to the millennial kingdom, not, excuse me, the eternal state, in Revelation 21 and 22, there's no sun, there's no moon. The universe is lit by the glory of God. The sun is a star, we believe, like many other stars. That would indicate if there's no sun or moon that there are no stars. The universe will be different then. I believe the, the original universe was different also. There was an empty space and there was a planet. Because you don't have the sun, the moon, and the stars until you get to the fourth day. It's different. And I think that this is, uh, is, is the best answer to explain when Satan fell was between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. And so there's a regenerative activity that is taking place, a restorative activity, which is part of the role of the Holy Spirit. He is the one who oversees regeneration, according to Titus 3.5. And so the Spirit of God is hovering. The word there is like a bird um, uh, over her eggs, taking care, incubating her eggs. And the Holy Spirit is hovering over the face of the waters. And so the very beginning of Genesis, we see this picture of the Spirit of God in terms of a restorative or regenerative uh, role. Then in Job 26, 13, we're told by his Spirit that God the Father, by means of his Spirit, as a distinct entity, he adorned the heavens. So that indicates that God uses the Spirit as an instrument in decorating the heavens. That indicates the Spirit is a distinct person and has a distinct role. And 33.4, the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. That is a very important verse. I'm not going to get off into a sidetrack here, but think about this. From the perspective of Job, it is the Spirit of God who made him, and the breath of the Almighty. This is the same word that is used in Genesis chapter 2, God breathed into Adam, and he became a living being. So it is that breath of the Almighty that gives physical life to the individual. That is when I believe the soul is imparted uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the baby, to the infant, when he uh, comes out of the womb. That is the ancient interpretation. Then you have passages like Isaiah 40, 13. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord? The answer is no one could do that because the Spirit of the Lord is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. Who can teach him anything if he's omniscient? Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has taught him? And then Psalm 104.30, you send forth your spirit. So Yahweh sends forth his spirit. That indicates a different entity. And the spirit is related to creation. They are created, and you renew the face of the earth. Another emphasis on the renewal role of God the Holy Spirit. So uh, this, uh, in terms of uh, Genesis 1-2, that is the only reference to the Holy Spirit in Genesis. And uh, there's some indication, possibly in some statement by Pharaoh, but it's uncertain and ambiguous. Uh, he's probably just speaking of a God, and it's, um, at best, it's just a generic reference to the Spirit of God. Then we come to references from Moses and from Exodus on through the post-exilic period. Moses is when they are leaving Egypt. The post-exilic period is when they're returning from Babylon. Exodus 31.3, God, uh, he says, I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. This is talking about uh, Bezalel. Uh, God is filling him with the Spirit of God. So that's a 
uh, very important aspect. And it, it's notice it's related to uh, wisdom, skill. But in what area? It's in the area of his craftsmanship. We'll look at that again in just a minute. In the next two verses, uh, it's wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and all manner of workmanship. Now, if you take that out and you go to the main clause, I have filled him with the Spirit of God to design artistic works, to work in gold, in silver, in bronze, and cutting jewels for setting, and carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. We see that the filling here by the Holy Spirit is related to what? is related to the fact that he's a jeweler. It, he's a goldsmith. He's a silversmith. He's a, he's a metallurgist. He is a designer of uh, the jewelry and the um, wood. He is an, an um, inspired carpenter to do all of the work and design all of the work for the, for the tabernacle. So this is not a ministry related to spiritual life or spiritual growth but related to a skill related to the worship of God and the leadership of God's covenant people. The word there is malah in the Hebrew, which simply means to fill. It would be similar to um, uh, play ra'o in the, in the New Testament. It just means to fill something up. In related, relation to leadership skill, in Numbers 11:17, this is after Moses has been trying to do everything himself, and it's just wearing him out. And so he, his father-in-law Jethro comes to him and says, you really need to learn a little bit about delegating responsibility, and you need to uh, select some uh, wise men, and then you need to give them responsibility over the people, over the uh, hundreds and thousands and ten thousands, so that this is not a burden to you. And so God, uh, God validates that, and he tells Moses in Numbers eleven seventeen, Then I will come down and talk with you there. That's at Mount Sinai. I will take of the Spirit that is upon you. So that is talking about the Holy Spirit and will put the same upon them. So these elders of Israel in that generation are also going to have a relationship for the Holy Spirit. But what's the purpose? The purpose is to give them wisdom and skill at leadership, at uh, applying the law of Moses, to applying the covenant of God to the people, and to dealing with their, their conflicts. After the return from the exile, this is actually the third return. You had two with Ezra, and then this third one with Nehemiah. You, uh, Nehemiah says, you also gave your good spirit to instruct them, talking about the Exodus generation. So that's relating back to the passage we just looked at. And did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. So Nehemiah mentions the Holy Spirit after the exile. So it runs all the way through the history of Israel. Then you have passages in Isaiah, and it talks about this going back to this Exodus generation and subsequent uh, rebellion. It says, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy, and God fought against them. Isaiah 63, 10 and 11 says, Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people, saying, Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them? That is, dealing with the leadership. So this is not dealing with the spiritual life. It's not dealing with spiritual growth. It has to do with God has given the Israelites as his covenant people a mission. And he gives them leaders, and in order to strengthen and enable the leaders, the priests, the prophets, the kings, the administrators, he gives them at times the Spirit of God in order to give them abilities uh, to lead the people, to lead his theocratic uh, government. So that brings us to what's going on in Judges. What's going on in Judges is that the Holy Spirit is going to empower 
these leaders in different ways. In a, he's going to give them a military skill, a military ability. He's going to give them an insight into uh, some aspects of leadership, and but mostly it's military. It has some political leadership decisions, but mostly it has to do with uh, military. As we see in... Um, in Judges 3.10, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. That is Othniel. And it's simply, the, the Hebrew is very simple. The Spirit of, of the Lord was upon him. And he judged Israel. Judging This isn't legislative judging or judicial judging. It is a broad term for, for leadership. What did he do? He went out to war. So the Spirit of the Lord coming upon him is related to his skill in going into war against uh, Kushan Rishathaim, the king of Mesopotamia. Judges 6.34 is the second message. So we've gone through the other judges. We've gone through Ehud, and we've gone through uh, Deborah and Barak, Skip, you know, went past Shamgar. Now the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Gideon, and this is the word lavash, meaning to wear or to clothe. The Holy, the Spirit of God clothes himself with Gideon. Now you'd think that if you're putting Gideon on, it, 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 it's an image of filling, but it's a different kind of word. It's a very graphic, descriptive sort of word. Then when it comes to Jephthah, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he goes out to do battle against the Ammonites. So it's giving them this military skill this, uh, at, at, at defeating the enemy. And he uses the same terminology that you had in Judges 3.10 with Othniel. Judges 13.25, there's two or three mentions of the Spirit in Samuel. And remember, Samuel doesn't do much that's good as described in the book of Judges. Nothing good is said of Samuel, I mean of uh, Samson in the book of Judges. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord began to move or to impel him uh, toward Mahanadan between Zorah and Eshtaol. And that word is used a couple of times with, with, uh, uh, with, with uh, Sam, Samson. How does the Holy Spirit impel him? Is this internal? Is it external through circumstances? We don't know. It's, it's just not clear. All we're told is the Holy Spirit impels him. Then, in the, uh, then with the kings, we know of Saul and David. 1 Samuel eleven six. Then the Spirit of God, uh, Ruach Elohim, came upon Saul, 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 when he heard this news and his anger was greatly aroused, that is, against the attack. It's a righteous anger against the people being attacked um, by the Philistines. So the Spirit of God came upon Saul, and, and it's going to relate to his military skill at defeating the, the Philistines at that time. Then we skip to David. Uh, by this time, the Spirit of God has departed from Saul because of his carnality, because of his sin. And Samuel is going to anoint David, Samuel the prophet, indicating that the rule of the king was always under the authority of the word of God. Uh, this was recognized in a very famous work by a Puritan uh, theologian by the name of, of Samuel Rutherford, who wrote a massive tome on, on political theory called Lex Rex, the law is king. In other words, the king is under the law. The law comes from God. The king is under God. It's not rex lex. It's not uh, the king is over the law. So the king is subservient to the law and subservient to God. So Samuel is going to anoint David and the spirit of the Lord. It uh, comes upon David. This was the same word used for the spirit of the Lord coming upon Saul, Salak, which means to rush upon uh, David, and from that day forward. So it has to do with giving David military skill, defeating the Philistines, defeating uh, the enemies of Israel. In First Chronicles. Now, First Chronicles and Second Chronicles are written also after the exile. So my point here is to show that this is from Genesis before the flood, uh, relating what happened before the flood, 
written by Moses. It, the Spirit of the, of the Lord is mentioned through these uh, historical books, Sam, uh, Judges, Samuel, mentioned in the post-exilic books like Nehemiah, uh, Malachi, and, um, and Chronicles. So this isn't some new idea that pops up somehow near the end of the Old Testament period. Uh, David gave, this is really interesting, David gave his son Solomon the plans for basically the temple, the vestibules, houses, treasuries, etc. And the plans for all that he had, everything that, that uh, Samuel had in terms of what, how to build the temple came to him from David and was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. The plans for all that he had by the Spirit of the courts of the house, of all the chambers around, the treasuries of the house of God. So it's all revealed by the Holy Spirit. It is God's design. Uh, 1 Samuel 6.14 talked about the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul because of God's judgment or divine discipline on Saul. And not only did the Spirit of the Lord leave, but the Lord sent a distressing spirit. This is, other passages talk about an evil spirit designed uh, to distress Saul and as part of divine discipline on Saul. David prayed in Psalm 51.11, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. This is a result of his sin of adultery with Bathsheba. So he's, he knows that he has really messed up. And so he's begging God not to take the Holy Spirit away like he did from, from Saul. And the Lord did not. But this does not apply to church-age believers. There are a lot of Christians who get the idea that well, I can lose the Holy Spirit. I've got to pray this prayer. They don't understand these distinctions between the Old Testament dispensation of Israel and the dispensations of the law and the church age today. Hiram, who is the king in Tyre, and this suggests that uh, I have a belief that you don't get the role, the Holy Spirit, a ministry from the Holy Spirit, if you're not a believer. And I think this suggests that, that Hiram was a believer. And he was filled with wisdom and understanding and skill. These are the same words that were used of a holy ab in Bezalel. And he is the, uh, he's the project manager for the construction of the, of the temple. So in the same way that God gave wisdom and skill and the Holy Spirit to Bezalel and Aholiab, he gives that same wisdom and skill to Hiram. Uh, uh, here to Hiram of Tyre. Uh, we have references to some prophets who are temporarily empowered by the Holy Spirit, such as Azariah in Second Chronicles 15, 1 through 7, Jehaziel, who during the reign of Jehoshaphat in Second Chronicles 20, verse 1, 22 and 23, mentions the Holy Spirit. Zechariah during the reign of Joash, who was a prophet, in Second Chronicles 24, 20, remember when Jesus is talking to the Sadducees and confronting them with their disobedience, he said, you've killed all the prophets from Abel to Zechariah. Zechariah is the last prophet mentioned in Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles is the last book in the way that the Jews organized the canon of Scripture. The last book in the English order is Malachi. But the last book in the, in the Hebrew Bible is Second Chronicles. And so what Jesus is saying is from A to Z, from Abel to Zechariah, you've killed all the prophets. From the first book of the Old Testament to the last book of the Old Testament. And that shows that by this time the canon is probably fixed. The Hebrew Old Testament is probably, uh, probably fixed. Now just as a little teaser of coming attractions, one of the things that we're going to be focusing on in next year's Chafer Conference is I have three speakers coming. Uh, so, uh, some of them, uh, two of them you know or are familiar with, Randy Price, who is retiring from Liberty University in about 29 days when he finishes the course he's teaching right now at Liberty, at, uh, for Liberty at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And I hope he'll be, I'm pretty sure he's moving back to, 
Texas, I don't know when, but Randy's going to come, and he'll be one of the speakers. Doug Petrovich, whom you know well, is going to be another, a second speaker, and then a third speaker is one you don't know, and that's Dr. Henry Smith, who is with the Associates for Biblical Research. And these guys are going to drill down on a lot of fascinating things related to archaeology and an understanding of how we got the Old Testament. And the thing is, with most, I would say 99 percent of the pastors that are coming have never heard any of this except for those who come on my Friday morning class because we're going through a lot of this material, this sort of preparation. But most of this material has just been discovered in the last, um, in the last 40 years. When I took Old Testament introduction, which is where this type of material would be covered, we didn't cover any of this material because nobody had... Uh, Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 48, but they were kept within a small group of scholars. Nobody else ever got to look at them until there was a lawsuit and they had to be released in the 90s. And then, I'm, you know, I've got all of it on my computer now. And so we can all study the, the, the fragments from Qumran, and it's just remarkable the things that we're discovering. It, it, it's not scripture, but it, but it helps us to understand how people understood scripture, which is phenomenal. Uh, the Qumran community understood many, many passages, including Psalm 146 that I talked about on Sunday morning, as messianic psalms, messianic prophecies. Most modern evangelical scholars don't believe that, which I think is wrong. So, I mean, we're going to get into a lot of stuff, and everybody's going to be pretty much at the same level, which is pre-K, pre-kindergarten. So these guys are used to talking to audiences that don't have much of a frame of reference for this, and it's just fascinating. The guys, the men on Friday morning are just loving it. So we've got all these, and in Micah, Micah 3.8, we read, but truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. So Micah is recognizing that it is by the Holy Spirit that he's received this revelation and he is empowered to bring this conviction uh, to Israel, identifying their sin. So you have the role of the Holy Spirit in the civil administrators, the elders that, uh, that Moses appointed, where God promised, I will take the spirit that is upon you and will put the same on them. Uh, Joshua, uh, Numbers 27, 18, the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, with you. You know, Joshua didn't have any parents. He was the son of Nun. Just seeing if anybody's awake. All right. So, uh, Joshua, the son of Nun, with you, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand upon him. So, Joshua, as a general, and as one who would write Scripture, is empowered by God the Holy Spirit. We also see the role of the Holy Spirit in prophecy as we start to bring this to a close. The role of Spirit in prophecy in Isaiah 11.2. Now this is interesting. Some of the language here is kind of echoed in Psalm 146 I touched on Sunday morning. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Who's him? That's the Messiah, the servant of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. So this is a messianic prophecy. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So six things are mentioned there related to what the Holy Spirit will manifest in the Messiah. In Isaiah 30, verse 1, Woe to the rebellious children. So in this chapter you have, in several chapters in Isaiah, you have these woe judgments. Hebrew for woe is oi. That's where that comes from. Woe. It, woe is the uh, way to uh, preface an announcement of divine discipline. Woe to the rebellious children who take counsel, but not of me, says the Lord, and who devise plans, but not of my spirit. 
So there's two personages here, two divine personages here. There's, there's Yahweh and there's my spirit. Isaiah 42.1. Behold my servant. Okay, so you have one personage in my servant. That's the Messiah. Behold my servant whom I, who's speaking? God the Father. Whom I uphold, my elect choice, that is my choice one, who is the Messiah, God the Son, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Again, that emphasis on justice to the world is echoed in Psalm 146. So that's why I say those, those things that it says that God does, that he takes care of the widow, the orphans, he brings justice to the world, all of those things, that is fulfilled only in the messianic kingdom. It is not for today. So what do you have? You have my servant, one person, who is also my choice one, uh, the Messiah, God the Son, and a third personage, my spirit. So he, people say, well, you don't find the Trinity in the Old Testament. Really? You have three divine persons here. Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. Now, this is the passage that Jesus partially quotes when he is uh, speaking in the synagogue in Nazareth. And he gets up and he reads. The, he's supposed to read in the scroll of Isaiah. And he reads halfway through verse 2 and stops because the remainder of verse 2 and verse 3 all relate to the millennial kingdom, and that's not fulfilled in the first coming. He says, the, spirit, the prophecy is the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. So you have the Spirit, number one, first personage, of the Lord God, the second personage, me, the third personage. So you have three divine persons he mentioned here. The Spirit of the Lord God is, appoint, is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. Now notice how God here is in uppercase. That means the God there is, is translating Yahweh. The Lord here in lowercase is translating the Hebrew word Adonai, which is just a general word for Lord or Master. And then down here you have Lord uppercase, that's Yahweh. Whenever you see Yahweh, there's an emphasis on God as the covenant God of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Mashiach is the Hebrew word for anointing. So the one who is speaking is the Mashiach. He's the anointed one. What's he anointed for? To preach good tidings to the poor. That's echoed in Psalm 146. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Also echoed in Psalm 146. To proclaim liberty to the captives. And the opening of the prison to those who are bound. In Matthew, this is quoted with reference to what Jesus was doing in his first, first half of his ministry going to Galilee. It, that uh, In this passage, it talks about a light coming to the Gentiles, and, I mean to the, to the tribes in Galilee, to Zebulun and Naphtali and along the coasts. So he's preaching good tidings. Heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening of the prison to those who are bound. To console those who mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they may be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Now that specifically is directed to Israel. But that's true. If you, you, you know, you look around this world today, you may have, a, you may get depressed. Don't you, many people have quit watching the news. It's too depressing, too discouraging. You've got a spirit of heaviness. But what we're told here is we're going to have that spirit of heaviness replaced with a garment of praise when we're in the kingdom. So that is what we have to look forward to. Isaiah 63, 10, but they rebelled. That is speaking of the Israelites. They rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy, and he fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old Moses and his people, saying, Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit 
within them. What a great passage. Not New Testament. This is Old Testament. Ezekiel. Now, when, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he talks to Nicodemus in John 3 about this new birth that it is, you must be born by the Spirit and of water. Nicodemus doesn't go, what are you talking about? Jesus mentions the Holy Spirit knowing that Nicodemus should know exactly what he is talking about. This is one of those passages. Uh, I, Ezekiel 11.35, The Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said, Speak, thus says the Lord, Thus you have said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind. Now, when we skipped Ezekiel 36 and Ezekiel, 30, uh, Ezekiel 36 and Ezekiel 37, these two passages relate to the establishment of the new covenant with Israel. And part of that is that God says he will put the Spirit inside every Jew. This isn't talking about the church age. This is talking about the new covenant when Christ comes and establishes the kingdom. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. And verse 37, 14, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. So putting his spirit in them, and you shall live, speaks of regeneration. And many people think that's what Jesus is expecting, expecting uh, Nicodemus to connect the dots. He's talking to Nicodemus in the early part of his ministry. What was the message in Matthew, Mark, and Luke of, that Jesus had at the beginning of his ministry? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he's, it, it's this, he's expecting Nicodemus to connect the dots that they need to be regenerated so that the kingdom will come. What did he tell him? You can't see the kingdom unless you've been born again. He didn't say you can't get saved unless you're born again. That's implied. But he's saying you can't see the kingdom unless you're born again. And then we have Joel 2, 28 and 29, a verse that Peter quotes in Acts 2 and that many, many people take out of context because Joel 2 talks about what will happen when the Lord returns and establishes his kingdom and all of the things that are listed here, none of, of, of all the things that are listed here, none of them happened in Acts 2. The one thing that happened in Acts 2 was speaking in unlearned languages. And guess what? That's not mentioned here. All that Peter is saying in Acts 2 is this that you're seeing today at the temple on the day of Pentecost is similar to the kinds of things that will happen when the Spirit comes and establishes the kingdom. He's just emphasizing this is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's not a work of man. So the prophecy here is it shall come to pass afterward. Afterward, after what? Well, in the previous verses, it's the day of the Lord. It's the battle of Armageddon. It shall come to pass after the battle of Armageddon, after Christ's victory, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, not all believers, all flesh. All means everybody. And it's primarily to Israel, because those that have survived at that point are the only ones who have survived are believers. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. But they clearly understood there was this entity called the, the Spirit, God's Spirit. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. And Zechariah 4, 6 says, So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So the Holy Spirit is clearly a distinct divine entity in the Old Testament. It's not just another way of talking about God. There are conversations, as we've seen, where you have three personages, especially in those Isaiah passages. The Spirit of the Lord, you have my servant, the Messiah, and you have Yahweh. Three distinct personages are clearly present in the Old Testament. Many other passages indicate that, that the Spirit of the Lord is a distinct personality 
from Yahweh. And in many passages, you have at least those two person, persons present. So the Holy Spirit is active in the Old Testament. He is active in revelation. He's active in regeneration. He is active through the prophets in giving revelation and in scripturating that which they are to write for, script, for scripture. But his role is not in the realm of spiritual growth and spiritual maturity like it is in the New Testament. They are not baptized by the Holy Spirit because Christ has not yet come. There are nothing to identify them with yet. They are not indwelt by the Holy Spirit as the making the temple, making us a temple to God. They are not filled by the Spirit with the Word of God as we are in this church age. So none of these ministries that we have today are part of what was happening in the Old Testament. It was completely different. But we have the clear indication that, that he does empower leaders to fulfill their function, whether it's as carpenters, architectures, craftsmen, jewelers, or as military leaders, commanders, or as priests, or as prophets. But it's not the same as the church age. So we have to keep that distinction. So next time we'll come back and now that the Spirit of the Lord has come upon Gideon, Gideon will be directed to lead the army of Israel, but it's got to be the right size, to lead the army of Israel against the Midianites and the Amalekites and the others from the east. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things and to recognize that we have such a unique privilege because we are permanently indwelt by God the Holy Spirit, and God the Holy Spirit works to mature us in Christ, strengthening us in the inner man, and we are to walk by means of God the Holy Spirit, and it is as we do this that God the Holy Spirit matures us and strengthens us. So Father, it is so important that we have this ongoing fellowship with God the Holy Spirit, which means a partnership in walking to a common goal. And that common goal is the uh, development of the character of Christ, making us Christ-like in this life. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.